This uh, presentation is, in a way, a continuation of Bill Wilson's talk last month, in which he described how the scientific method was used, uh, in fact, how it was originated, and then used to determine the speed of light. And he pointed out quite accurately that the ancient philosophers like Aristotle would just sit around and think and make up stuff as to about how the universe was supposed to be and did a lot of deep thinking, but it wasn't until the time of Galileo that we actually got into doing experiments. Uh, and I believe uh, Bill mentioned the dropping of the two different weights off of the Leaning Tower of Pisa in order to uh, dispel the common notion that heavier things fell faster than lighter things. So. Uh, that kind of basically gets to the heart of the scientific method. If you have a theory and you test it with an experiment and there's a disagreement, you generally have to go with the experiment. So seeing is believing and then you have to revise the theory to uh, take into account the new observations. And that's certainly the case here. This was a problem that started in about 1965, as we'll see, and persisted for uh, just over 40 years before it was figured out. Now, 1965 was about eight years after I joined the Astronomical Society, so I kind of saw this whole thing uh, first be posed as a problem and then uh, struggled with for decades and then finally worked out uh, fairly recently. At least it seems recent to me. Uh, However, let's don't sell the idea of sitting around thinking uh, short because even when you have data, you still have to analyze it and use critical thinking on it before the scientific method will work. If you want to test that out, I think you could find if you ask the first 10 people you meet after leaving the meeting, have they ever noticed that the moon goes through phases, like they'll have a full moon and a what they would call a half moon. So yeah, they've noticed that. But if you ask them why, I'm not sure you'd get a whole lot of correct answers from that. So observations are not everything. You have to have observations and critical thinking, sort of like uh, faith and works or something. You can't have one without the other, it just won't cut it. So that's the way the scientific method worked in this case, and we'll definitely uh, take a look at that. Let's see if I can uh, get this to operating. Yes. Let me adjust the lights because some of these pictures will be a little dimmer than others. We aren't going to need that. And I need that. I taught here, what, 34 years, and I never got the hang of how to do these lights. <laughs> <coughs> well, in my defense, up and down don't mean anything because there's another whole bank of switches in the back and it depends on how those are thrown as to how these work. So it's kind of a crap sheet. Okay, the solar neutrino problem. First, we need to look at a little bit about what the sun is and then uh, what it does and how it does it, uh, where it came from and what's in store for the sun. You can have my seat while I'm up here. <laughs> uh, the heart of this is the thermonuclear reactions that take place within the sun and allow it to give forth its heat and light. And part of the things that go on in those reactions is the production of neutrinos. And we need to have a little bit of time devoted to just what they are and how you would go about detecting them to see if the theory of the thermonuclear reactions is correct. And then, uh, I guess it's no big secret that there was a problem for 40 years that the detection of the neutrinos didn't match what the theory predicted. So that had to get worked out. And then the happy ending. Uh, the first time I gave this presentation, we didn't have that part of it. It still hadn't been worked out. It was still uh, up in the air, a lot of ideas were going around. It was kind of like the quasars, which uh, dragged on and on and on with all kinds of preposterous theories as to what they might have been, but 
eventually it got worked out. Okay, starting with the overview of the sun. We've had uh, a number of presentations about the sun lately, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on that. This is a uh, sort of a full-size picture of the sun showing some uh, sunspots. These were one of the first things that Galileo discovered, and that was kind of the beginning of the end that the universe was perfect. Uh, found zits on the sun, and it's, okay, here we go. We're having to start changing things already. Uh, the limb darkening around the edge, notice it looks kind of like a baked sugar cookie. In fact, you might have some demonstrations or something <laughs> <laughs> back there, Sarah. I don't know if we've got a sugar cookie we can expose, but uh, it's a whole different reason here. The edge of the sun isn't cooked more than in the middle. What we're looking at there is the surface of the sun. Uh, I'm, whenever I say surface of the sun, put quotation marks around it, if you will. Uh, the photosphere through a thicker layer of the atmosphere than you would see in the middle. It's sort of like when the sun is overhead here, where it looks brighter and uh, whiter than it does when it's near the horizon because we're looking through a thin layer of atmosphere right above us then, whereas when it's about to set or has just risen, we're looking through a longer area of atmosphere, so that makes it look dim near the edge. So sometimes we have complicated names for things. This one just kind of makes sense, limb darkening. Of course, you have to know that limb means the edge of the sun. Here's the sun in hydrogen alpha. The, uh, the hydrogen alpha line, some of you all have uh, uh, hydrogen alpha filters that we use for that uh, to show the sun in, in this particular aspect. And what uh, happens here to put this color light out, you can see it's red, it's 656 nanometers on the uh, metric scale, and the uh, transition within a hydrogen atom that produces that light is electrons fall from the third energy level down to the second. Uh, all of the visible light that we see from uh, hydrogen ever comes from <coughs> electrons falling from some higher level down to the second level. You could think of these as concentric shells around the nucleus. That's uh, kind of oversimplified, but if you can think of it that way, uh, you don't go too far wrong in your calculations. So the third to the second shell gives us the hydrogen alpha. The uh, uh, fourth to the second shell is hydrogen beta, and it's kind of a teal color, and then each one gets a higher energy because of a bigger jump, and shorter wavelength is uh, a result of that. Prominences are definitely features on the sun that are worth looking at. Uh, some of us have the ability to see them uh, on any clear day. Others have to wait for a total solar eclipse for the sun to block out the, or for the moon to block out the sun, leaving only prominences near the edge. They are associated with sunspots. Now sunspots are as a result of the magnetic fields going on within the sun. Just backtracking just a little bit, the sun is made up of charged particles. The temperature in it is so high that you have nuclei with positive charges and free electrons floating around, not really attached to their atoms anymore. We call that a plasma. And then the sun rotates as a result of the way the whole solar system was formed. So what happens when you've got rotating electric charges. Well, that generates a magnetic field. That's how a generator works, or in reverse, it's how a motor works. So the sun is uh, generating magnetic fields, lines of force within it. And when those lines of force, you can think of it as either like a golf ball or a big bowl of spaghetti with these lines of force tangled up inside, when they reach up near the surface, the ends of them, which are like the north and south poles of a magnet, uh, material comes spewing out of the sun, loops up, and falls back in. And uh, that's one of the more interesting things you can see during a total solar eclipse. Here's a, an eruptive solar promise over near the edge of the sun here. Uh, this is one where the force of the material coming up out of the sun is 
greater than average. And instead of just simply looping back in, a lot of that material flies on off into space, and hence the term eruptive. Uh, this can have a more extreme case. If we, whoops, look at that, the uh, solar flare. A flare is a tremendous outburst on the sun, and material comes out of that and flies on off into space. Notice that this one is kind of near the limb or edge of the sun. That's where you want them. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> right, if it was in the middle, that means it's aimed right at us. It's just like when you're out observing meteors, what you don't want to see is a little bright stand spot still. standing still. <laughs> that means it's headed right at you. So on the, when you're observing solar flares, you, you want them off to the side because they uh, wreak havoc with radio communications and give nice auroral displays. And you know, it's just sun acting up and we're close enough to it where we feel the effects of it. Sun, it goes without saying, has a tremendous effect on the Earth, as we'll see in some detail uh, shortly. Now here we get into plages or plage, depending on your preference. The plage is the French word for beaches, and at some point somebody decided that these bright white areas look sort of like beaches. Uh, don't think anybody thinks they're actually beaches anymore. Maybe they're <laughs> sunny beaches. <I> don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, that's not the main point of this photograph. What is, is these little worm-looking things around. Those are prominences seen face on. And uh, instead of off at the edge where they stick out against the dark background of space, we're looking at them silhouetted against the bright surface of the sun. Uh, Philum is the Latin word for thread. And so these look a little bit like thread sticking up out of the surface of the sun. A cutaway view of the sun. The interior part is where the thermonuclear reactions take place that we will look at in greater detail very shortly. As the reactions take place, they produce tremendous amounts of energy in all forms, and that works its way eventually out to the surface. Now, the, uh, this uh, convective zone uh, is where the uh, energy pretty much is transferred from one atom to the next, and the energy gradually decreases so that it moves towards the surface almost in a straight line. The, uh, uh, excuse me, that's the radiative zone. The convective zone is out here, where the, uh, there's a lot of circular, uh, teeming and seething uh, just below the photosphere. And it's kind of like if you're boiling a pot of water or syrup, you'll see uh, things rising to the top and circling and floating back in. So the uh, radiative zone is where the energy comes out of the center and the convective zone is where it circles around just before it gets to the surface. And here's kind of a side view of that. <clears throat> the interior of the sun, which we're just looking at, the photosphere, again the quote surface, where the light is emitted from the sun. Just above the photosphere is the chromosphere, which is a cooler layer, and that's where absorption takes place. Some of the uh, continuous rainbow spectrum that the photosphere puts out is absorbed, and it's uh, each element that's present in the chromosphere is uh, represented by absorption lines across the spectrum. We won't go into that in any detail tonight, but uh, that's where helium was discovered, by the way, from its spectrum, the absorption spectrum during an eclipse. The spicules are little peaks or little spikes that stick up from the chromosphere into the corona, which we'll see shortly. Uh, uh, Spicules means little spikes, but as you can see from the scale here, if you convert that to miles, they're about 4,000 miles tall. So uh, they completely dwarf anything on the Earth. And then finally, the corona or outer atmosphere of the sun, where all of the material that comes boiling up out of the surface uh, accumulates and then flies off into space. And we have a picture of that coming up in just a moment. 
Here's the very um, highly magnified view of the surface with granulations. Again, if you've ever boiled sugar syrup on the stove, this is a whole lot what that looks like. Little pieces come to the top and pop open and fall back to the inside. And that's the uh, surface of the, the, the photosphere where the light is emitted. Uh, here's a close-up of a sunspot group. And uh, nearly always they occur in pairs, one being like the north pole of a magnet, the other being like a south pole. And prominences frequently develop between them with material gushing up out of one and then getting twisted by the magnetic lines of force and falling back into the other. Looks a whole lot like what happens if you put a horseshoe magnet under a piece of paper with iron filings on it. The shape of those uh, lines of force is a lot like what is associated with the sunspots. Now this is a um, animation here. I think I can possibly get that to work. We'll see. Well, that's no big deal. It just kind of looked like a you swoop in and then look underneath and there's a uh, looks like the sunspot is made out of orange and blue plastic and it rotates 360 degrees and then goes back to this. Uh, which the main thing that proves is that just because you can do an automation doesn't mean it's a good idea. So, <laughs> but uh, which saved me the trouble. Okay, here are some pictures of the spicules, the little 4,000 mile high spikes that stick up out through the chromosphere into the corona. And there's the corona itself, as imaged by Freddie at the last uh, total solar eclipse that we had a couple of years ago. It's hard to believe it's been nearly two years since we uh, got to see that. But here's the uh, corona blocked out by the moon uh, so that the sun uh, doesn't wipe it out. That's about the only time we get to see it real well. And it's an extremely high temperature and it, the little particles coming out of the sun go faster and faster and faster as they get farther away. And uh, by the time we, they get here to the earth, we refer to them as the solar wind. And presumably all stars do that because there is a galactic wind. In fact, I've been called that from one time to another. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. The history and future of the sun. The famous Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that shows what would happen if you made a graph, which scientists like to do, of all known stars, or at least all the ones that were known at the time, with the vertical axis being their luminosity compared to the sun, how bright they truly are. And the left to right horizontal axis is, can be several things. It can be their peak color or spectral class or their temperature, which is probably the most useful thing. So the relationship that we see, if all the stars were on this, what's known as the main sequence, if all of them were on that, that would give a good indication that the hotter a star is, the brighter it is. And the cooler it is, it would be dimmer. And this diagram is not totally accurate because it, it kind of skimps on the ones that are on the main sequence and uh, emphasizes the ones that are not. But most stars are on the main sequence except for the ones that aren't. <laughs> now the, do me a favor and forget the word sequence or at least, uh, or at least white it out or underline it or put a footnote next to it that that was an early idea that is no longer in effect. A sequence makes it seem like something is happening in a particular order. And their original thought was that stars started out up here as blue giant stars, and after their lives were over, they would wind up as red dwarfs. Now we know that that's not the case, that stars uh, spend practically their entire lives at one spot on the main sequence and don't evolve from one type to another. Uh, the red giants and supergiants, we know they're big because we can measure the temperature of the surface quite easily. And the fact that they're cool and each square meter of surface doesn't radiate that much energy, there's a whole lot of surface area which makes them very bright. So that tells us that they're uh, very big stars. 
using the same logic but in the other direction, some stars are white hot but rather dim. Only a, a thousandth or so as bright as the sun or even less because they're very small. So that's why we call them the white dwarfs. Now all of those things are important because the sun will eventually be all of them as we'll see uh, shortly. First, a star starts out as a cloud of gas uh, called a nebula that usually rotates and condenses and packs itself together under the force of gravity to form a new star, going through a protostar phase and uh, eventually winding up at some spot on the main sequence. And for the sun, this is its spot. Uh, just to, as a reference point, you can see a star that's 10 times as massive as the sun would wind up much higher on the main sequence, very brighter and hotter. Most of the, uh, nearly all stars, or all stars, after they are formed, spend most of their lives on the main sequence. Here's just kind of an aside. One new star formed each year in the Milky Way galaxy. Now that doesn't, that gives you an erroneous picture if you don't know the whole story that here's a star, this is the one for 2019. Next year another star will be formed somewhere else. Now they form in clusters of thousands of stars each, but it takes millions of years. So the average works out to about one per year, but don't picture it as one star each year. The location of a star on the main sequence, as we saw just from looking at the graph, depends on its color or temperature, the horizontal axis, and its luminosity or brightness compared to the sun on the vertical axis. As long as a star, and here's the, the first inkling of our main topic for tonight, as long as a star remains on the main sequence, it converts hydrogen into helium by thermonuclear fusion, which is the same thing that takes place in a hydrogen bomb. And that's what releases heat and light from the star. As we'll see in the next slide, <clears throat> the energy released by that fusion in the center of the sun balances the force of the star's gravity trying to collapse it. It's what causes the reaction in the first place the tremendous gravity squashing everything together, and we'll see how that works very shortly. But the energy produced balances the gravity. This is called hydrostatic equilibrium. If you want to go out of here and impress somebody, tell them you learned about hydrostatic equilibrium tonight. All that means is that at any point within the sun, the pressure generated by the heat uh, coming from the reactions at the center of the sun is exactly balanced by the gravity at that point. This point's fairly close to the center right there. So it's got a high gravity and a high pressure. This point right here is farther out. So the pressure coming from the center is less, but so is the gravity since it's farther from the center. So at every point there's a balance, otherwise the sun would be flying to pieces. It does fluctuate some, but that's another whole topic. Okay, the power output of the sun. This is kind of interesting. The power per unit of area at the surface of the earth is 1,350 watts per square meter. That's sometimes called the solar constant, even though it's not. It, it fluctuates because the sun is a variable star. But this is an average value. How big is a square meter? About like a card table. So if you have a a square meter of surface aimed at the sun, it's going to be receiving 1,350 watts, which is a, a lot of good sized light bulbs. Yeah, well, I don't have to tell you that if you stand out in the sun, you'll feel uh, that kind of energy coming down upon you. The average hair dryer is about 1,200 watts. 1,200, yeah, okay, for a hair dryer. <laughs> no, I, I, I won't say it. <laughs> Okay, at a distance of 93 million miles, uh, we can figure out uh, how much energy the sun is putting out altogether. We know what it is in one square meter. All we've got to do is figure out how many square meters they are in a spherical surface uh, 93 million miles away. And the surface area is, of course, 4 pi, 
times the radius squared. So we take that uh, energy per square meter times the number of square meters, and we get 3.8 times 10 to the 26 watts. And at that point, we start losing the ability to picture that kind of number. But uh, 3.8 times 10 to the 26 joules per second. A watt is defined as a joule per second, or the energy flow per unit of time. Um, if calories helps better than joules, they're about uh, 4.184 joules per calorie. So this is close to being just 10 to the 26 dietary calories or kilocalories per second that the sun puts out. Okay, here's the famous overview of the reaction of burning hydrogen into helium, which the main sequence stars do. Uh, four hydrogen atoms, protons, produce one helium nucleus and energy. I decided to put in a different unit here, million electron volts. We could put it in almost any form of energy, but uh, this is one that we do see frequently. If we do this with one gram of hydrogen, this uh, gives 24 million electron volts times the number of atoms that are there, divided by four, because we start out with four, and for one gram of hydrogen uh, undergoing this reaction, we get 5.8 time, time, times 10 to the 11th joules per gram, or 10 to the 14th joules per kilogram. Now that's a tremendous amount of energy from one gram or a kilogram, which is about 2.2 pounds. So when this reaction takes place within the interior of the sun, huge amounts of energy are released beyond our ability to even comprehend it. Now, so the, how much energy does the sun have to, or how much hydrogen must the sun burn to produce the amount of energy we just figured in the first step here? Well, we just divide one number by the other. Take this one divided by this one, and we wind up with the sun is burning uh, nearly six, or about, about seven, uh, almost a trillion kilograms per second of its material. Now you'd think you can't burn up a trillion kilograms every second and have it last very long, but that leads to the, to the next part of the calculation. This is just a carryover here. Uh, the mass of the sun is two times 10 to the 30th kilograms. So that means there's a, a lot of material there to undergo this reaction. It'll go on for a lot of seconds. If the sun could burn up all of its hydrogen, it would then be able to just last by this divided by this, or that many seconds, or 100 billion years. The only catch is that the sun can't burn up all of its material because only that in the central part of it is under enough pressure and temperature to carry out the fusion reaction. The part up near the surface uh, won't undergo this reaction, so once about 10% of the sun's mass is used up, then it's done from doing this. So the sun will run out of fuel after about 10 billion years. Now it's already been about 5 billion, so it's got another 5 billion to go. We can calculate the lifetime of stars on the main sequence and we see that it depends on their mass and luminosity. The lifetime, it would be however much material it has, that'll make it last longer, right? And however luminous it is, how uh, much energy it's putting out, that uses up the mass, so that would make it uh, last a shorter time, so that's why it's in the denominator. Reference to the sun of 10 billion years. So if you just plug in one for the mass compared to the sun, which is what the sun is, and one for its luminosity compared to the sun, then we get the 10 to the 10th or 10 billion years. However, there's a little uh, interesting kicker to this, and that is the luminosity depends on the mass. Now if you think about that for a minute, it makes sense. What is it that makes the sun or any star put out energy? It's the nuclear reaction going on in the center. Well, what causes that to happen? It's the pr tremendous pressure and heat of the, caused by the gravity of the star mashing on its center. Well, what causes the gravity? It's 
the mass of the star. So the more massive it is, the harder it squashes the center and the faster the reaction takes place. So the mass determines the luminosity. So here's a sort of a graph showing the uh, mass of a star in solar masses with the sun being there at one, 10 solar masses, a tenth of a solar mass. And let's just look at the equation instead. The luminosity of a star compared to the sun is equal to its mass compared to the sun to the 3.5 power. Now I'm not sure how many physics equations you've run into, but having an exponent of 3.5 is very unusual. Most things are proportional. Like if you have twice as much money, you can buy twice as much candy at the candy store. It's, most things are proportional. Sometimes the exponent is two, like the inverse square law. If you get twice as far away from a star, it's one-fourth as bright. But having an exponent like this is very unusual. And here's how it works out. If you had a star with twice the mass of the sun, its luminosity would be 2 to the 3.5 or 11 times as bright as the sun. And that's an example of that would be the star Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. is about two solar masses and about 11 times the brightness of the sun. So a lifetime of stars on the main sequence really only depends on their mass. So when the primordial nebula that makes a star cluster is getting divided up into different little portions, each one of which will become a star. Its fate is determined. How bright it's going to be, how long it lasts, the whole works by how much material is in that pile of gas that turns into that particular star. So some examples, if we put the uh, mass equation into the luminosity expression, then we find out the lifetime is 10 to the 10th years, of 10, 10 billion years divided by the mass to the 2.5, which is still a pretty big exponent. Or you can turn it around the other way and base it on the luminosities. Here's some examples. We've already seen the sun. So, Rigel, bright blue star in Orion's heel. Or, uh, uh, let's see, in the summer, uh, Spica, would be a good example of a blue giant star. 60,000 times as luminous as the sun. So we put it into the luminosity equation. It only lasts four million years compared to 10 billion for the sun. It's like one of these rock stars or athletes that winds up with a big pile of money and then burns through it all in a couple of years and then dies penniless. The, the a star like Rigel only has a total lifespan of four million years. The dinosaurs never saw a Rigel. Red dwarf stars down at the bottom end of the scale are chugging away at a very low luminosity with very low mass. They're expected to last 20 billion years, which is well beyond the age of the universe. So there are probably no red dwarf stars that have expired yet. They're still there on the bottom right corner of the main sequence. Now, solar type stars, as I mentioned earlier, by the time they get to the end of their useful lifetimes on the main sequence, will have consumed about 10% of their hydrogen. They can't work that reaction out any farther because the pressure and temperature aren't great enough that far from the center. So the core contains mostly helium because that's what it's been doing converting hydrogen into helium. So that's what's mostly there. And a few other heavier elements, some of them made by the star itself, others that were captured when the star was formed. You know, the sun is not one of the original stars of the universe. It's at least third generation in the Milky Way. So it's got stuff that was made in other stars and blown out through the universe and supernova explosions and worked into it. So there are plenty of other elements there. It's just predominantly like 98% hydrogen or 95% hydrogen, about 2% uh, helium, 3% everything else when it started. And in the center, 20 million degrees Kelvin, that's what it takes. We'll see exactly why it takes that coming up shortly. The first stage of its thermonuclear fusion, the hydrogen into helium, then stops 
sort of like if you had a fire going in your fireplace and the wood burned out and all you got is a little pile of ashes. Well, that's pretty much over then, but not with a star. The ashes catch fire. The helium that was made in that whole first reaction starts combining. And three helium nuclei fuse together to form a carbon nucleus. And that goes on and so on and so on till we get up to elements as heavy as iron, but that's not part of our problem tonight. Yes? So that, um, it's three, uh, three and a half generations of uh, sun they used to make the sun. Mm -hmm. How do they come up with that? Because looking at the Get right, the composition, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big guess. How did, they, how did they do that? Well, the, the elemental composition is determined from the spectrum and the absorption lines in the spectrum, like we uh, saw there at the beginning, the, from the chromosphere. You assume that the chromosphere is about the same composition as the photosphere. It's just above it and cooler, so it's absorbing energy, and you can tell what elements are there and in what proportions by the... Uh, lines that are there. Okay, this is some strange drawings here, but here's a, a helium nucleus that was formed in the first part of the sun's existence, reacts with another one and forms a beryllium nucleus. And then that beryllium nucleus reacts with a third uh, helium nucleus and forms a carbon <coughs> nucleus. Why is this triple alpha? Well, that's because uh, Helium nucleus is the same thing as an alpha particle. Uh, all alpha particles are, are is just a helium nucleus that's shot out of a decaying nucleus of a big atom, but uh, here we call it alpha particle even though that's not the case. Here's the overall reaction. Three alpha particles give you carbon and some energy in the form of gamma rays. So, as I just mentioned, uh, the core fuses the helium into carbon and heavy elements all the way to iron. And uh, we won't go into tonight why it can't go farther than that, but this is what the sun uh, and stars like it will all do. And more energy comes out from the ashes being burned than from the original fire, which is remarkable. And the core temperature increases to about a trillion degrees Kelvin. And that, of course, makes the star expand. And a star like the sun will get to 100 to 200 times the size that it is now, which uh, makes a big difference, makes a big difference for us. The uh, outer layers, though, are so far from the center that they actually cool down and turn red. And at that point, this much bigger star that's got a cooler surface is what a red giant star is. I'm sure everybody's heard of those. Now the surface is cooler, but it's more luminous because it's 100 times, 200 times the diameter that it was, and it's got a lot more square meters on its surface than it used to. So that makes them appear where we saw in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, over towards the right where the cool ones are, but up towards the top where the bright ones are because they're cool and bright. Now, things will really be different here when the sun becomes a red giant. The atmospheres of the inner planets, uh, Mercury's is already pretty much gone, but uh, Venus, Earth, and Mars will lose their atmospheres. All the volatile materials, including the water, will get boiled away. And no life will be possible under those conditions unless we figured out some other way to do it first. This will happen in five billion years. The Earth, because the sun will be so close, will be glowing a dull red like the sun itself, and the sun will occupy 75 degrees in the sky instead of a half a degree as it does now. So if you think it's been hot lately, just, uh, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> <clears throat> Mercury and Venus will wind up inside the outer layers of the sun and the friction will spiral them into the center. And the expansion of a, a star to become a red giant takes place so rapidly in astronomical terms that the surface just keeps going. It, it kind of doesn't know when to stop. It uh, expands and casts off a shell of gases, uh, which we call a planetary nebula. Here's another word that I want you to 
forget, kind of like the main uh, sequence, uh, the planetary nebula has nothing to do with planets except early astronomers thought they kind of looked like planets, a little glowing disk. Uh, in, in their primitive telescopes, they uh, thought this was a, a planetary-like thing. We've got a, some pictures of those coming up, the Owl Nebula and Ursa Major, Ring Nebula, which I understand you all didn't look at the other night because you're looking at the planets. The actual planets, not the planetary nebulae. Oh well, you can do that. <laughs> so then, yeah, okay, next week we'll get to the planetary nebulae. The red giant again starts to contract and causes it to get hotter and yellow and uh, moves across the top of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram going towards the left and then it gets unstable and starts pulsating becoming a Cepheid variable or some other similar type of variable star which is way more variable than the Sun is now. The Sun now is very, virtually steady but these are uh, amazingly uh, variable. Eventually it starts to shrink and continues to stay hot, white hot in fact, but since it's getting smaller and smaller the surface area is now much smaller and now it becomes uh, a dwarf star, white dwarf. An uh, example of that is Sirius B, the companion to the brightest star. Uh, comparable to the Earth in size, but almost uh, all of the material, uh, at least half or maybe more of its material is still there, but instead of being, uh, the sun right now is about a hundred times the diameter of the earth, it'll be about the same then. That's a million fold uh, decrease in volume for about half the mass. So it gets tremendously dense, uh, 6,000 tons per cubic foot. I like to mix units up here so you can see. Just imagine a cubic foot like a briefcase weighing 6,000 tons. And then eventually keeps cooling, becomes a black dwarf, and that probably hasn't happened yet. It takes so long to cool down because it's got a very small radiative surface. It can't uh, put out a lot of uh, heat and light, so it just kind of sits there and gradually gets dimmer and dimmer and probably don't have any of those yet. Okay. Here's the whole story on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram again. The new star forms right there, stays on the main sequence for 10 billion years, then uh, converting hydrogen into helium, then switches over to burning helium into carbon as it becomes a red giant, sends out the planetary nebula to surround it, then uh, goes through the variable unstable stage, getting yellowish and fluctuating, and then uh, it wouldn't have killed them to just make that graph a little bit wider there. But when it comes around the corner here, it's headed back down towards the white dwarf size with very high temperature, very small size. So that's the story of the sun. And here's just a picture of a white dwarf star compared to the size of the Earth. Here's the Owl Nebula in Ursa Major, just below the bowl of the Big Dipper. And, uh, Here's the star that did it all. It was a solar type star, then became a red giant and cast off this shell of gases. This is three dimensional spherical. It looks kind of like a disc, but it's really a, a spherical shell. Then uh, eventually cooled down or, or shrank down to become a white dwarf right there in the center and you can easily see it. Uh, one that's a little older that's had time to expand a little more is the Ring Nebula in Lyra. And here's the star that did it all and the beautiful uh, colored ring that surrounds it. In an amateur telescope, you don't see the, uh, almost any telescope, you're not going to see the colors. They turn up in photographs, especially if they're goosed up in the uh, various processing uh, programs. But uh, in most of our telescopes, it looks like a little Cheerio sitting there in the eyepiece. But, that's what will happen to the sun in five billion years. And here's the sequence again in a linear fashion. Gas and dust to form the star, main sequence, 10 billion years, red giant, planetary nebula, and the white dwarf. So that's the uh, 
what is happening to the sun and has and what probably will. Now, if we're uh, bound and determined to have a break, this is a stopping point, but if we want to keep going, uh, we can do that. What's your pleasure, Mr. Wait. President? Hmm? Wait. All right. You want? Okay. Well, call the shots there. Okay, the next part, are you back on the air there? Are, you, are we running? Okay. Yeah, the next part deals with the uh, details of the thermonuclear reactions that take place in the sun now while it's still on the main sequence. The overall reaction, as we've seen before, is the four hydrogens uh, and two electrons. That's kind of added in here to balance the equation. And we produce one helium nucleus and two neutrinos which are very small particles. They have no charge and almost no mass, and five or six gamma rays, the highest form of, highest energy form of radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum. When they realized this, though, did they, they thought neutrinos had no mass, right? For the longest time, and it kind of got resolved by this by the, particular problem. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So where's the energy come from that comes out in the gamma rays and, and to a lesser extent in the neutrinos? Comes from the mass lost during that reaction. Well, at first glance, if you look at the reaction, you see that the mass here of the hydrogen is four ones is four and two zeros is zero and then we got a four on the right side. So four goes to four. Doesn't look like any mass is lost. But as I used to tell my physical chemistry students on the first day of class, if we only measured things to two or three significant figures, most of physical chemistry and physics would not exist because all of the interesting and complicated theories that we have are based on things measured out fifth, sixth decimal place. And that's where we start actually understanding things beyond the simple stage. Here's a little more detail. Each hydrogen atom, uh, or six times 10 to the 23rd of them, weighs 1.00728. We round that off to one here, but here's what it actually weighs. So that's the mass of the hydrogen. And the electrons we show as zero, but it's not quite zero. Electrons do have a, an appreciable but small mass. If we add together the masses on the left side, we get 4.03 and change grams. Now the helium nucleus on the right is 4.00150. The gamma rays are absolutely massless and the neutrinos are very close to it. Uh, so there's a difference. The reaction takes place and that much mass is lost, the uh, 0.02872 grams. When you think about it, this is remarkable just right here. It's like you had a model kit, a plastic airplane or something. And for some reason, before you put it together, you weighed all the pieces and you got a certain value. And then after you snapped it together, it weighs less. And you say, this can't be right. So you take it all apart and weigh it again and it's back what you thought it was the first time, you put it back together and it's less again. So when we put these atoms together to form this, it doesn't weigh as much as it did to start with, which all goes to nuclear binding energy, which we're not going to go into this evening, but it's an interconversion of matter and energy. If you put energy into it to break it apart, then the mass comes back. Here's the equation. I mean, this is on T-shirts. Everybody knows that equation. Yeah, that little tiny number times 186,000 yeah. squared. If you take any little number and you multiply it by the speed of light squared, you're going to get an appreciable uh, amount of energy. And so, uh, and here's the definition of a joule: kilogram meter squared per second squared. So the units work out. This gives us 2.58 trillion joules emitted when we 
Start out with how much? Four atoms. Well, not just four atoms, four grams of hydrogen. We have something maybe about the size of a small ice cube. If that turned into helium, then we would uh, be giving out uh, trillions of joules from that tiny little amount of hydrogen. And it all comes from the missing mass being multiplied by the speed of light squared. The reaction only occurs in about the 30% radius from the center. That's where about the 10% of the hydrogen is that gets used up in uh, the first phase, the main sequence part of a of star's life. The reaction follows, this is the overall reaction. It follows two different mechanisms depending on the mass of the star. Now what's a mechanism? Well, that's the sequence of events that a complicated overall procedure is actually broken down into. Even in Memphis traffic, you seldom see a four-way collision where four cars crash into each other at once. <clears throat> the mechanism may be something like this. Somebody runs a red light, somebody plows into them. That's the first step. Then, somebody's there texting and poking away, they run into them. And then when the police come, they may run into the three cars that are already wrecked. <laughs> so that would be the mechanism of how to get four cars to crash in Memphis. So here's the part that's the Nobel Prize level work. It's from Hans Bethe, who in the late 1930s, about the time he was escaping from Nazi Germany, uh, came up with this set of equations that describes the reactions that take place in the sun. And a uh, number of years later, after a lot of supportive evidence came in, you can't just dream up something and get a Nobel Prize for it. It has to have some basis in fact. The, the second branch of our scientific method that I was talking about earlier, then he got the Nobel Prize in 1967. When I saw a few years ago that he had died, I was amazed that he was still alive up to then. As you see, he lived 99 years. So I, he was, I figured, an old man when I joined the Astronomical Society, and then to find out this was just a few years ago that he finally died, that was kind of a surprise. Here's the, one of the main reactions that takes place in the sun. It's called the proton-proton reaction because the first step involves our first collision between two protons. What it forms is a heavy hydrogen or deuterium nucleus. Sometimes you'll see that written with a capital D as if it were a different element, but since it still just has one proton, it's still hydrogen. It just has a neutron in it, which gives it an extra mass. The mass of the regular hydrogens is one, and to distinguish them, sometimes we even call that protium, to distinguish it from deuterium or even tritium. And a, what is this? It's, it looks like an electron, but it has a plus one charge instead of minus one. It's a positron. It's the antiparticle of an electron. So it's an anti-electron and a neutrino is produced during that step. Now that particular neutrino is a, kind of less energetic than one we see farther down the way, but it's uh, still a neutrino that comes out. Now, what does antimatter do when it runs into matter? They combine, annihilate each other, and they totally disappear and turn into energy. So there are plenty of electrons around in the center of the sun, so our positron reacts with an electron and turns into a gamma ray, which then heads on out. Then this deuterium nucleus, or heavy hydrogen nucleus, reacts with another proton, a third one, and forms a helium nucleus. Helium because it's got two protons in it, but this is a light form of helium. Normally, remember the alpha particle is two helium four. This is missing a neutron. And we get a gamma particle, or gamma ray, excuse me. Okay, we do it all again. There are plenty of protons there, so it just goes through it again. This is what happens when we add these up and then we double it, and this is what we get up to that point. Then, when we get the two light helium nuclei, 
they combine with each other to form a regular helium and we get two protons back. So when we add this reaction with this one, then we get overall the four protons, two electrons gives the helium nucleus, two neutrinos and five gamma rays. So this is the overall reaction and this is the mechanism for it. And this accounts for about 80% of the sun's output. Now, can you see from looking at these steps why this can only take place in the interior of the sun and hydrogen bombs? For a hydrogen to react with another hydrogen, those are positive charges and you have to squash them into each other. They have a force field around them that repels each other. They don't want to do that unless, like in Memphis traffic, there's a lot of it so the vehicles are very close together. That corresponds to the pressure in the center of the star. And unless they're speeding, which is the temperature, the faster they go, the more likely they're to collide. So high temperature, high pressure can make things happen that are improbable otherwise. And this, as I said, is about 80% of the sun's output. Here, the other 20% is due to the carbon-nitrogen cycle. In this case, a proton reacts with a carbon nucleus. Remember, uh, the sun is uh, at least third generation star, so <coughs> it has all kinds of other elements there. And this, as you'll see, acts like a catalyst. It isn't used up, it's given back, so it doesn't it's not in the overall equation. So the product of that reaction is a light nitrogen and another gamma ray. That light nitrogen uh, breaks down to form a carbon and a positron and another neutrino. And then that light carbon reacts with another proton to give a regular nitrogen and another gamma ray. And that in turn reacts with another proton to give a light oxygen and a gamma. That uh, breaks down to form a nitrogen uh, with a heavier than normal nucleus and a positron and a neutrino. That reacts with another proton to give us a carbon nucleus and an alpha particle, helium nucleus, and a gamma ray. And we've accumulated two positrons on the right side of the equation, right? That's those still there. They react with two electrons to form two gamma rays which leave. We add all of this up, nearly everything cancels except the four protons, two electrons gives the a helium nucleus, two neutrinos, and this time six gamma rays. That's the only thing different in this mechanism and the other one is the six gamma rays instead of five. Does that mean this puts out more energy? No, it puts out exactly the same amount of energy because that's determined by the difference in mass of the products and reactants. What it is is the gamma rays have different energy. The six have averaged a little bit less than the five in the previous reaction, so it works out exactly the same. So there's our overall reaction again. The neutrinos are very elusive. They go right through the sun. It takes them 2.4 seconds to get to the surface and another eight minutes to reach the Earth. So they don't uh, fool around. The Gamma rays are handed off from one atom to the next and work their way all the way up to the surface, losing little energy each time, getting longer wavelengths, and it takes tens of millions of years for them to get to the, quote, surface of the sun and leave as photons coming towards us. Then it takes eight minutes for them to get there. Their energy decreases as they work their way up to the surface. The wavelength increases to the part where you can see them. We can't see gamma rays. But we get the distribution of something that's at that temperature from Planck's law. If, if the surface temperature of the sun is uh, around 6,000 degrees Kelvin, it has a peak energy right in the green part of the spectrum and falls off to either side. So there's a distribution of wavelengths and I'm sure you've heard me say before that the maximum intensity of the sun's energy is in the green part of the spectrum, which is right where the maximum sensitivity of our eyeballs is. So it's amazing how the sun evolved to take advantage of that fact so we could see it. <clears throat> okay.
the neutrinos carry about 2% of the energy from the nuclear reaction in the sun, and the gamma rays carry nearly all of it, 98% of the energy that's produced comes out through the gamma rays, but it takes longer. Okay, we've seen a little bit about neutrinos. Here's a little bit more about them. Neutral and nearly massless. <clears throat> At first they were thought to be totally massless because it's kind of hard to measure anything that small. If they were absolutely massless, they would travel at the speed of light. But if they have any mass at all, they would be traveling at slightly less than the speed of light, like the other particles that come out of the sun. So it's almost like a photon, but a little bit like a particle. So it moves almost at the speed of light, but not quite. Just as its mass is almost zero, but not quite. But it doesn't react with neutrinos. Neutrinos are extremely elusive. I'll uh, we'll get to that at the beginning of the next slide, I think. They come in three different forms or flavors, depending on the quarks that are present. <laughs> Electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos, each one associated with the production or consumption of a, those particular subatomic particles. Each one of them has a corresponding antiparticle. Now, is, what, what do you call an antiparticle of one that doesn't have a charge in the first place? What's the, well, you have a minus zero charge. Well, you just put a bar over it to indicate that it's a, an anti-neutrino of the electron, muon, or tau type. They barely interact with matter. Someone figured out once that they could pass through a wall a light year thick made out of lead. So they don't do much interacting with things. They just go right on through. Uh, the supernova 1987A in the LMC, uh, the speed at which they moved, we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, shows that their mass is less than 10 to the minus 11th that of a proton. Now that's getting right up near zero, isn't it? Uh, previously, they had thought that maybe their mass was as high as 10 to the minus eighth that of a proton. If that were the case, neutrinos could make up all of the mysterious dark matter in the universe easily. But uh, Jeremy's still in business because that's not true. You still have to work on what dark matter really is. Now the supernova reaction, uh, remember the explosion takes place partway between the very center and the surface of the star. And when the, the, that spherical shell explodes, it drives the outer part out, makes a supernova remnant like the Crab Nebula or the Veil Nebula, and synthesizes all the rest of the heavy elements in the periodic table beyond iron. Uh, the inner part, the force of the explosion is focused in on the core of the star and that and so such an intense explosion that it causes protons and electrons to merge together to form neutrons and the electron neutrinos are formed along with it and that's those are the ones that come popping out of a supernova explosion and in case i hadn't mentioned it before the solar nuclear reactions, both the proton-proton and the carbon-nitrogen, produce only these electron neutrinos, the nu sub e. About 65 billion solar neutrinos per second pass through each square centimeter of the Earth's surface. So if, you, so if you go outside tomorrow when the sun's up and you hold your thumb up, your thumbnail's about one square centimeter, Every second, 65 billion neutrinos from the sun are passing through your thumbnail. And only a fraction less than that right now with the sun down. Right, they're just coming up the other way. <laughs> yeah, very uh, close to that same effect, just coming up through the earth from the other side. So they're very difficult to detect. It'd be sort of like if you were shooting target practice at a target and there was no interaction between the bullet and the target. It'd be kind of hard to detect exactly where you were aiming. So 
They, they're very difficult to detect, so only a few different certain atoms can react with them. The first attempt, and I remember this well, to measure the flux of solar neutrinos was in 1965. Uh, Ray Davis built a, a tank underground at the Homestake Gold Mine, an abandoned gold mine near Lead, South Dakota, a mile below ground, and put 100,000 gallons of perchloroethylene in it. Now, not every chemical is that easy to find, but this is also used as dry cleaning fluid for laundry, so there's plenty of this around. So they put 100,000 gallons of this in this underground tank. Now, neutrinos can react with chlorine 37, but chlorine is about 75% of it is 35, and the rest of it is 37. If you look at the periodic table over here, where uh, chlorine is, you'll see that the mass is 35.45. And that's the average, the weighted average of mostly this and some of this. And it's only these that are going to work. So you're right off the bat, you've lost three-fourths of your detectors. Here's the tank. <laughs> I could clean a lot of shirts. <laughs> 100,000 gallons of dry cleaning fluid inside there. Here's the reaction that takes place when the neutrino hits the chlorine 37. It... Uh, well, overall, it turns it into an argon atom. Uh, argon, uh, atomic number 18, and its mass is 37, and an electron comes out. Inside the nucleus, here's what's actually going on. The neutrino hits one of the uh, neutrons that are in the uh, nucleus of the chlorine atom and turns it into a proton, and the electron comes flying out. Notice that this is the opposite of the supernova reaction where protons and electrons combine to give neutrons and neutrinos. If you look on the periodic table, you'll see that the next atom over to the right with the next highest atomic number is argon. So if you turn one of the neutrons in here into a proton, it's going to have the next highest atomic number. Now, argon-37 is radioactive and it's a gas, so that makes it relatively easy to isolate. You don't get that many of them, but they all kind of float to the top and you can suck them out and when they accumulate, just see how many of them were there. <coughs> Predicted frequency, about one per day in that whole tank of 100,000 gallons. One of these reactions per day. That takes some dedication to plan and carry out and get money for an experiment that's gonna have one reaction a day. However, the results were significant but disappointing. They only got one about every three days over a 20-year run. So here's the beginnings of the uh, solar neutrino problem. So other experimenters. I guess they were able to detect that radioactive. I mean, one particle a day. Mm -hmm. How hard did they detect that radioactive gas? Well, you, you don't detect one. You have to let a yeah. bunch of them build up. But then with uh, Geiger counters and, uh, I don't know, cloud chamber, any number of ways, any number of ways to detect uh, decay reactions, you're not detecting the argon itself. You're detecting its decay products when it decays. Okay, a Galax, a gallium experiment. Set up in 91. This is a while later. Remember, that first one was set up in 65. Now in 91, it's time to try something else because that cast a lot of doubt on uh, Beta's equations. 30 tons of gallium. And the Soviets built one, 50 tons of gallium. The reaction is an electron neutrino hits a gallium atom, turns it into germanium and an electron. And the germanium is, uh, although it's a metal, it was in a salt form, chloride, but it's converted to the hydride, which is another radioactive gas, which can be sucked out and detected. And this particular reaction is sensitive to the low energy neutrinos from, remember, the first step of the proton-proton reaction that produces a neutrino, and I said it was a little lower energy than the last step. Uh, 
Well, it's sensitive enough to pick it up. So they were hoping that this would clear up the problem. So they predicted about 17 per day in this gallium experiment. This varied all over the place, anywhere between zero to nine, but never anywhere near 17. So the problem was there, but uh, even more uh, uncertain because of the range of those uh, results. A third type of detector set up in the 1980s and upgraded in the 1990s used neutrinos reacting with water molecules which produces little flickers of light, and then you detect the flicker of light to count them. Uh, and without going into the details, they only got about half of the rates that were expected from that as well, the Kamioka detector. Okay, that leads to the realization that we had a problem here. We had these Nobel Prize winning equations Remember, he got the Nobel Prize in 64 before they started disproving it with the, with the various detectors. Uh, the, all the experiments were after that, and that didn't look so good. I don't think they ever take one back, but it really didn't look good. So the problem, uh, what caused the shortfall of neutrinos? Might have been some sort of experimental setup error. Well, um, probably not, because it had worked for the detecting the supernova uh, 87A. I remember the cover article on Sky and Telescope about WIMPs, a weakly interacting massive particle. Uh, physicists have a tendency to make up a particle whenever you need one for something, and most of the time they're right, and then they get a Nobel Prize too. So weakly interacting massive particle could carry off energy from the core of the sun which would lower the temperature and reduce the rate of the reaction and not produce as many neutrinos, and maybe that was the explanation. So it'd be enough to, it'd have to be enough energy carried off to have a two-thirds reduction in the neutrinos coming out. However, somebody got to thinking and said, well, this would also cause the sun to be a lot smaller and dimmer than it actually is. So that was kind of quickly ruled out. Another possibility. The sun might not be generating neutrinos now. The reactions in the center may come and go. It might be that um, millions of years ago, the reaction was going on, but it was starting to taper off. And the, the equations are okay, but they're just not going on for some reason now. So that's, uh, and we know we've had ice ages and various temperature cycles. Maybe that's what was happening. Now this would, could be disastrous for the Earth. And the, well, I don't know the Earth would get along without us, but it'd be disastrous for us. The sun, uh, if occasionally stops fusing hydrogen, we could have a, a big effect on the Earth's climate. After all, the sun is the most important influence on the climate of the Earth. That's not too surprising. Although it's not universally accepted. Here's a couple of things from our <laughs> global warming thing. The constant is not carbon dioxide that causes things. The, the concentration of CO2 follows the changes in temperature, not vice versa. And here's where the logic I was talking about that Aristotle could have figured out a couple of thousand years ago that if A happens and then B happens, B isn't causing A. It's got to be the other way around if they're related at all. So when the ocean temperature rises, it dissolves, the, it expels some of the dissolved carbon dioxide from the water into the air. And here's a, showing the CO2 level increasing, and most of it happens after a peak back in the early 1940s of the temperature. So since the sun is mainly responsible for warming the earth, could some other measures of solar activity correspond to trends in climate? The, you all know about the sunspot cycle. We don't always have the same number of sunspots. They rise and fall in an 11 year pattern. And if you take into account the polarity switch from north to south poles at the end of each cycle, the cycle is really about 22 years long on average. We always have to keep sticking that on average in there because some of them are longer and some of them are shorter. 
Whenever we have a short solar cycle, the sun puts out more energy during that period of time. And when we have a longer solar cycle, it puts out less energy uh, per day. The, the solar constant decreases during that time. It's almost as if, and somebody needs to check on this, that the sun puts out a constant amount of energy during each solar cycle. And if it's stretched out, it's a lower intensity. If it's a shorter cycle, you get a higher intensity. That would be an interesting project for somebody to look into. And here's kind of a side thing. During maxima in the solar cycle, the shielding from cosmic rays is increased. If cosmic rays have anything to do with Earth's climate. And finally, here's a correlation between temperature fluctuations on the uh, Earth's surface and the length of the solar cycle. 11 years being kind of the average. Notice this scale is backwards so that the uh, lower length of time, the uh, shorter the cycle corresponds with higher temperatures. And you got a longer solar cycle that leads to lower temperatures and there's a very decent correlation there. And just one final thing here, Arctic temperatures. Here are the Arctic temperatures of the surface air and the CO2 level, which is uh, not a very good correlation. Watch this, it stays the same as we go to the next graph where we correlate it with the uh, solar cycle instead of the uh, CO2 levels. And we get a, a definite correlation. We see even the 11 year spacings on a lot of those intervals. Okay, other observations. <clears throat> the anti-correlation between the sunspot cycle and the number of neutrinos. In a long cycle, you get fewer neutrinos per day. In a shorter cycle, you get more neutrinos produced. So maybe as the sun's magnetic field increases, it causes some neutrinos to oscillate to other types, uh, which would, you know, if the detector only detects electron neutrinos, even though that's the only thing produced in the sun, if some of them oscillated to a different form, then they wouldn't be detected. And they were starting to get on to the truth when they started thinking along these lines. And here's, uh, was in 1998, they said this is one of the most serious problems in modern astrophysics where the uh, Nobel winning uh, equations seem to not be holding up to experiment. Remember what I said before that if you have a theory and you have experiments that deviate from it, you got to change the theory, usually. Sometimes there's something wrong with one of the experiments, but uh, you, that, that's how the scientific method works is you refine the theory with continued well, I guess experiments. The they held on to it and kept chasing it was because they set up detectors right outside of a nuclear reactor and got the predicted number of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, and also, uh, of course, beta was still alive then, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is the new part. Uh, how it turned out, the resolution of the problem. The possible causes, three types of neutrinos, electron, muon, and tau. The sun makes only the electron type, the chlorine 37 in the detector in the uh, gold mine only detects electron type, so that should have worked. But perhaps two thirds of the solar neutrinos, the electron type, change to other types. Suppose a got three electron neutrinos starting out towards the Earth, and one of them says, I feel like a mu neutrino today, so from now on, that's what I am. And another one comes out and says, I now identify as a tau neutrino. <laughs> so that's what it happens. So by the time those three get to the Earth, one of them's still electron, the other two have gone astray somehow. So, and that is predicted if neutrinos have mass, which we now know they do from the supernova uh, time delays and so on. Here's the guy who figured this out, uh, Arthur MacDonald. Uh, he came up in 1984 with the idea of that this might be the problem and how to test for it. And a number of years later, he did get the Nobel Prize for doing that. And, saving the one that Hans Bethe had already gotten.
This is done at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in Canada. And this uh, almost too cute logo here shows an observatory shaped thing. The O is the tank of what turns out to be heavy water inside, that's the heavy water, surrounded by another tank of regular water indicated by the plane stripes. So they put a lot of thought into it. Uh, <clears throat> Herb Chen was the one who originally came up with the idea, but unfortunately he came down with leukemia and died a couple of years later. So McDonald took over developing the theory and planning the experiments and designing and building the observatory. It's very much like the Kamioka detector, but it uses heavy water. Remember the 1H2 for the, instead of hydrogen? So it uses D2O instead of H2O, and that is sensitive to all three types of neutrinos. So from then, you know, it's just a sudden rush to the finish. They brought in a thousand tons of D2O, heavy water from the Atomic Energy of Canada, put it in the tank here. This is a, a 68 feet underground in another mine. Here's the tank that holds the heavy water, and it's surrounded by, uh, it's in a 40 foot acrylic vessel, and it produces flashes of light when the neutrino uh, hit the heavy water. It's surrounded by 9,600 photomultiplier tubes mounted in this geodesic frame. And the rest of the tank is immersed in a, a hundred foot tall barrel shaped thing that has regular water in it. Began operating in 2001. Continued experiments through 2007. They published the results in 2008. Can I hear a drum roll, please? Whoops. Whoops, whoops, hit the wrong button. The number of neutrinos detected is completely consistent with the standard model. They figured out how many hits they should be getting every day and they got exactly that. So that was a, a major breakthrough in so many different areas. So apparently the correct number of electron neutrinos are being produced in the sun. Two thirds of them alternate to the uh, non-detectable form unless you use the heavy water to detect them and then you catch them all. One of the results of good research is that other people can build on it. As of a few years ago, these papers were cited nearly 2,300 times, which means that there were 2,300 other papers that went on and developed further knowledge and advancement of science from what they had done. And verified, you can put that in quotation marks too, something could still come up later on, but that's how things work. In science, a theory is the highest form of knowledge. When you have all the information gathered, laws drawn, explanations behind everything and predictions that can be made from it that come true. That's what a theory is. Most people have a different idea of what theory means, but this is what it is. It verified that neutrinos can change flavor through that oscillation process. Now that had been done in the lab before, but this was the first time it had been done in a real life case of neutrinos coming from the sun. We knew how many were produced and what their distribution was when they got here. And it verified that neutrinos have a small mass because they can't do that unless they do have a mass. Yeah, yeah, that too. I wasn't going to get into that because this is above my pay grade here. This gets into weird uh, voodoo physics and stuff. Uh, and here's a little side detector. This can be used, or a side light here, an advantage. The apparatus itself could be used as a supernova detector because whenever a supernova in our galaxy occurs, which has uh, been every uh, kind of 100 years on the average, but we're way overdue for one. It's been like 350 since we've had one. So someday there's going to be a supernova in the Milky Way. And when it happens, the first thing that's going to be released is the neutrinos. Now they move a little slower, but they get a head start because they don't have to work their way through the outer shell of the exploding star. So 
they will get here first and tell everybody to turn off the TV and go out and watch the supernova develop. That's never happened before. We've never seen one from the very beginning, but this would be a, a, a first uh, advantage uh, for this, this detector after it's done its main work of verifying and solving essentially the uh, solar neutrino problem. So that's what I got. Thank you.